That was in September 1994. Many of the fittings were beyond repair, but most seriously the enormous forces generated by the swinging bells over 104 years had weakened the mountings of the oak beams. Eventually the vibrations would have damaged the tower. Early in June 1997, final preparations were made by our contractors Hayward Mills Associates to renew the old frame. A new modern steel assembly was to be installed, which would support the existing eight bells with provision for a further two bells. A grant awarded by the Millennium Commission, a body supported by the National Lottery to celebrate the year 2000, boosted funds sufficiently to allow the work to begin. We started in earnest later the same month when Andrew Mills and Colin Aikhead began dismantling the ropes, wheels and fittings. Every item had to be lowered by hand through three floors. Each of our eight bells was slowly and carefully lowered one by one by chain to the floor of the ringing chamber. From the original peal of five bells, our oldest two date from as early as 1625. They were augmented to six bells in 1890. All the work was under the attentive eye of Philip Mehew the project coordinator for All Saints Church. In any set of bells, more correctly called a ring of bells, the largest is known as the tenor. Ashover's tenor and a new treble bell were donated in 1902 to celebrate the accession of King Edward VII. These two brought the total up to eight. Placing the tenor in a safe position was very much a village affair. Because of its narrow doorway, this screen would have to be removed. Yeah. 
Local agricultural engineers, brothers Graham and Howard Townsrow, provided the scaffolding required to remove the glass from above the tower screen. They helped also with the dismantling of the screen and from this point on became part of the team. Later, Graham and Howard were to apply their skills and ingenuity to other parts of the project. Fifteen days into the project, the bells were taken to Taylor's foundry at Loughborough and the old cast iron frame to Hayward Mills premises at Nottingham. For 372 years, the Crispin had heard the bells ring out in the good times and the bad, but this was probably only the second time that the inn had actually seen them. The bells were being delivered to tailors to be fitted with matching headstocks. The headstock is the assembly which attaches the top of the bell to bearings mounted on the bell frame. Our bells have various types of headstock, some of which wouldn't have connected to the new frame. The old cast iron H frames may one day find a home in another belfry. Some of us were privileged enough to witness one of our new bells being cast. In fact, uh, I've got to tell you that I had the privilege also of stirring the brew, uh, and that has been captured people to see for the future. We also saw the other of our bells being tuned uh, and that was again a very uh, magnificent occasion for us, something which we who saw it will never forget. A group of us gathered together before being taken into the foundry to see our Millennium Bell being cast. The metal ingots are fired to a temperature of 1,100 degrees Celsius. In our case, this had taken two and a half hours. 
bells are cast in bronze, which is a mixture of copper and tin. When there is sufficient molten metal, a birch branch is plunged into the mixture, driving the impurities to the surface. This has long been known as driving out the devil. Sand is thrown over the molten metal to protect the foundry men from the intense heat. The metal is poured into a bell mould buried in the foundry sand pit. We also saw how the bell moulds are made and the inscriptions applied. They go off a lot more often than the bell moulds. So we do a lot of Air, which may be trapped in the molten metal, is released by stirring the brew, as I put it. This is perfect, isn't it? This is perfect. Is there anything wrong with this one? <laughs> Of the fitting of Alderbelt. It goes a headstock, a clapper, which is ferrous, <laughs> the rope. <laughs> <laughs> As you look along here, lots of different shapes of bells, and they're all different shapes. Now, the first thing I have is a very odd servant. You'll see the candles leave these two bells at the back. You've seen what we actually do to tune a bell. How do you tune it? You can't add any metal to a bell once it's been cast. You can't take any off the outside, you'll ruin the inscription, it's purely practical, but you can take it off the inside. And what they used to do was have a hammer and chip it away. You can see one behind you there that's really had a lot of chipping. The modern method of tuning still uses this Dickinson vertical lathe, installed in 1896. We witnessed the tuning of the bell donated by Miss Betty Bassett. This new treble bell has already been dubbed the Bassett Bell. <laughs> Jesse Arblaster is seen recovering these shavings from the Bassett Bell. They're now secreted in the church in a time capsule donated by Jeff Farmer of Adelphi Precision. To achieve the right sound, at least five major notes have to be harmonised into a musical chord. And if you take too much off and it goes just slightly flat, then you can slightly grind the edge to reduce it. It might be only a quarter of an inch mm -hmm. flat, and it brings the notes, but they're only a couple of sides. Done. Anyone else like a go? Oh, I thought you might, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have seen much soul searching, uh, much hard work on behalf of the committee that was put together to organise an appeal. And, of course, the fundraising, some very imaginative and ingenious fundraising events which have captured the hearts of uh, people in the parish and beyond. And, and Al Needham and his group were just great, weren't they? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They got it right, I think, because they had that break as well, didn't they? With yes. Sort of this <laughs>
galvanising the new frame. The frame and bells were pre-assembled to make sure that everything fitted together properly, as it would be far more difficult to make adjustments later in the tower. summer passed by and it was late October when the bells were returned now fitted with their new headstocks. The two new bells were also delivered giving us a ring of ten bells the same number as at the church with the crooked spire in Chesterfield. They were displayed in the ringing chamber for a period of three weeks so that everyone could see them. Time available for the lorry donated by Terry Jeffrey was limited, so the town rose tractor was rigged as a small crane to lift the bells onto the trolley. How are you for the church? By now, Andrew, Colin, and Ben of Haywood Mills and Philip Howard and Graham had become a close knit team. A few days later, the new bell frame, resplendently galvanised, arrived in the village. It was a magnificent sight, shimmering in the autumn sun. There wasn't enough space at the church to store all the frame, so the Town Road brothers took some of it to their farm until it was needed. Ladies from the church continued their flower arranging as the main beams of the new frame were hoisted up to the belfry.
The team worked late into the night so that the church would be ready for a memorial service the following day. Once the main beams had been positioned, the cross members were hauled up in a sparkling updraft of dust. During the time that the bells were there on the floor, we were pleased to have many, many visitors. And uh, I know that amongst them were the children from our school, from Ashover School, who came, all of them, not all at once, I'm hasten to add, but they did come in groups to see the bells. And they were captured by the magnificence of them. And uh, they realised that they were touching history. <laughs> them that if you just swing them like this it's called chiming the bells almost like chiming a school bell you'll all get a chance everyone will see them now which can which you think of the new bell is bell yes that's the other new one yeah. the bells go right above the yes, top yes, of the yes bell. Yeah, another one nice smile and this one this here be, this, one be... this one cracked when they rang it uh, when a man named Napoleon yeah, we told about Napoleon we went well team, they rang out the bells, say it was all over, and it cracked and they had to have it recast. Oh, it's a big metal clapper and it swings inside the bell. And where has it got to hit, Robert? How could she possibly ring a bell like that? You think it's heavy? You two come and move this bell out here for me. This is one of the new bells, right? You move that out so everybody can see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too heavy, and that's under the small frame. The old wooden frame became loose in the tower, right up there, high in the narrow parts of the tower. That's right, and that's got the date on 1997. This is our millennium bell. It's been cast to celebrate the year 2000. 1625. Now touch that bell. Okay. Heavy, isn't it? Yeah. Of course, the macho men will now say, oh, no, that's not heavy at all. But it is. It's really heavy. You can all have a feel of that at some time. So. It's like when you go on a swing. The assembly of the frame was now well underway, each of the many pieces slotting into place. When the main beams had been levelled, the majority were concreted into the walls. Just one beam was left free. It would have to be moved one inch sideways to allow the large tenor bell to be raised into position. This was one of more than a hundred buckets of concrete that Philip hoisted aloft to secure the frame to the tower walls. Then came the lifting of the tenor. 
They had to be winched by hand more than 60 feet to the top of the tower. It weighs as much as a family car, nearly a tonne. The chafing of the chain produces the muted sound of the tenor's note, always the deepest in any peal of bells. It was strenuous work the team taking it in relays to winch it inch by inch into the belfry. The gap between the loosened beam and the belfry floor was only just sufficient to let the bell through. We only need to get this half over this one, don't we? And then Timber's do it up there. Let's see how far we get it, but I'm thinking for easy getting that. Yeah. Yeah. It's all yours. Grey undercoating is applied by Ben to the clappers. All of the fittings would eventually be finished in Hayward Mill's company colour of green. Once the tenor was safely supported on the frame and the final main beam bolted and concreted into position, the rest of the bells could be brought up. Before the last bell, the Bassett bell, was raised into place, it was taken to the home of Miss Betty Bassett so that she could give it her seal of approval. More. Cannon, yeah, mm. cannon top on it. I'm more anxious to hear it than I'm to see it. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> nice to see it though now. Oh yes, well, well I, could be, could be really I do nice. thank you oh, all very, we'll very much for taking this trouble to bring it up. Yeah. yeah. It's bigger than I thought it was going to be. It's just over 400 weights. A bit right. heavier than me. It is. Like, oh, well, that's... Yeah. on the other side there. There we are. 12 o'clock, Miss Bassett. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking the pictures of them. Uh, uh, we did ring on VE day. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because it, it was in, when I used What's to deliver that? the milk in the village and uh, Alf Bowler yes. fished me out and I left my helper to finish the round we came and fished Kitty out and we went down and he fished, oh, I don't know, Harry Hopkinson's father and oh, yeah, a few other, yeah. Stephen Hopkinson and a few other, about six of us, I think. That's it. And we made a good old jangle. They hadn't been, hadn't moved for three years, four years, or whatever it was. Right. And so uh, um, uh, we let them know anyway. Can you reach it? That's it. Don't bite me, will you? No. Yes, I can, I can just read it. No, That's it. Yeah, yeah, 1997 on mm. it as well, yeah. Well, we say goodbye, now, we say goodbye to it and... You will, and then next thing you'll hear it. Then I have to... Farewell. Now all the bells were in the belfry, the side frames, or A-frames, which had been brought from the Towndrow's farm, could be bolted onto the main assembly. The bearings on the ends of the headstocks were bolted to the top of the A-frames. Oh, 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 oh. 
The rope wheels, stays and other fittings could then be attached. Colin fits a wooden stay into the headstock of one of the bells. The stay allows the bell to rest, or be set, to use a ringer's term, in an upside down position for full circle ringing. Work was nearing completion. All that remained was to fit the ropes to their wheels. Okay. Finally, each of the ten bells was test rung in advance of the service of dedication and thanksgiving. It's my pleasure to request you to dedicate the new bell frame, the two new bells, and the eight old bells, all now safely installed in the church camp. We gladly receive these bells and the new bell frame, and we thank you and all who have been part of this project for your faithfulness and diligence in performing this task. We now dedicate to you your name, a new frame, two new bells, and we have bells from the past, that they may continue to resound your praises throughout the parish to the honour and glory of your name. I commit these bells into your keeping, Tom, as rector of this parish. Ensure that they are used God's service and his glory. As the cure of this parish is both mine and yours, let us together chant the new bells. Now, if we get this wrong, Mr. John, we have a whole new meaning to the term flying bishop. <laughs>